So, um, I just want to thank our speakers. We have uh, Ed Honahan here, Master of the High Court in Ireland, and in that role I'd like to thank you here in the European Parliament for the outstanding work that you've done in trying to ensure that, there is, that in the very uneven battle between banks, vulture funds, and their teams of high-powered, highly paid legal teams on the one hand, and those whom they would dispossess and evict on the other, justice isn't just done, but is seen to be done. And I use that phrase very deliberately. Uh, I think it, it isn't just about taking sides one way or the other. I think it's you're basically just doing your job, ensuring that due diligence is done, and the due process is followed in every case that comes across your desk. But, uh, but of course, that was uh, the problem for the banks and the vulture funds, at least. Ed, you were too diligent, uh, probably too objective. Uh, you weren't doing uh, what was being done elsewhere in the Irish judicial system and allowing banks to get away with sloppy or incomplete legal paperwork. So in a move that should have had our national media in Ireland outraged, I don't know why I say should, I'm not surprised, but it didn't, uh, sign how badly we're served by the media, uh, they uh, took that work from you, unfortunately. Um, and if you want to discuss that today, Ed, uh, that's fine, but uh, you're basically here to talk about vulture funds and state aid in, in Ireland, uh, prima facie case, uh, that's the title of your presentation, you understand, or blurb. And I'll quote from it, in Ireland, some very modest Irish registered companies which enjoy special tax treatment claim only nominal profits, arguing that their cost of funds eats almost all their income. Is this another example of tax avoidance at point of sale, profits masquerading as costs? Uh, was it a sham? Um, uh, uh, what is real? So apart from the obvious, the potential for money laundering, the question must also be asked, should the profits on such investments be taxed where the securities are realised uh, on default or where the profits are books? Uh, trading in Irish property should be open to all market players on equal terms, but the circumstantial evidence, <coughs> Theresa May moment there, uh, is of an Irish market distorted by tax breaks not generally available to everyone. In this presentation, Ed, you're going to ask the question, has anyone uh, joined the dots? And uh, following Ed, uh, we're going to introduce uh, Constantine uh, for the uh, study that he has done. So we'll go straight over to Ed. Right, Thanks thank for coming here today. Appreciate it. Much, yeah. All right, I'm going to stand up. Now, that's where I usually make speeches. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking of doing a, a Mr. Cox on it, Archibald Cox, you know. <laughs> deep in the voice. <laughs> Look behind me. Gentlemen, yeah. what do you expect me to say? I've read the documents. Now, one of the problems about lawyers and politics is that lawyers tend to ask themselves questions. Am I, as what I've said, is, is it true? Can I stand over it? I can't simply throw out a comment and say, there you are, that's worth printing in the newspapers. I have to be able to say, that's accurate. It it's, can stand up to scrutiny. Any other lawyer will say, yes, he must have done his homework. It, it gets very, it's very difficult for somebody to prepare a, a, a presentation on a topic like this because I have to, first of all, read myself into it and then make sure that anything I say can be backed up with some materials. <clears throat> now you know why court cases take so long. It's because lawyers tend to come in and they put forward a submission about what the law is, and then they have to back it up. And that's where they feel like the validity or the historical roots of a, of a, a legal principle uh, can, be, can be found, which supports the submission. So the politician doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to say, I think we should drain the bogs, and I want to go back to James Dillon and move forward from there, talk about Mr. McGonagall and so on and so forth. He doesn't have to do that. He just throws an idea out there. And so there we have Mr. Cox, and he says, <coughs> incidentally, this is a joke, uh, <laughs> in, from Private Eye this week, he says, he talks about the ER Jihad group. <laughs> you can get that, no? No. Not the ERG group, but apparently some uh, instant oh. translation came up on the TV screen as ER Jihad group. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Bella Jihad dream. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Cox says, the problem is, what is good faith? What is bad faith? He says, 
Yes, we have done a deal. Mrs. May has done a deal. She says that if there is bad faith, Britain can walk from the backstop. But as a lawyer, I have to say, how am I going to prove bad faith on the part of one party or the other? If there is a glimmer of good faith in the negotiations from both sides, then there is no arbitration. There is no court which is going to say, you are now entitled to walk away. So as a lawyer, he says, that's where we are at. And <clears throat> this is what the Guardian had to say. <clears throat> the country's top lawyer turned out to be more interested in his integrity than acting in his party's interest. It was a dangerous new precedent for an attorney general. <laughs> he goes on to say, when Parliament had to, what Parliament had to understand was that the legal difficulties presented by the backstop were a secondary issue to the political expediency of getting a bad deal passed. So there's the balance, the lawyer and the politician. Language is the problem. Language is the problem with this issue, this issue as with most issues, uh, where there is law imposing itself on, on the work of, <coughs> of, the, of the marketplace. Right. Here is a quotation from Alan Greenspan. <clears throat> this is from his book, The Delphic Future. And he says, since markets have become too complex for effective human intervention, the most promising anti-crisis policies are those that maintain maximum market flexibility. Freedom of action for key market participants, such as hedge funds, private equity funds, and investment banks. This is quite shocking. We would have to rely on counterparty surveillance to do the heavy lifting, he says. It means the regulators are unable to, to regulate. A counterparty is the other person who signed the contract. He says... Markets have become too huge, complex, and fast-moving to be subject to 20th century supervision and regulation. This globalized financial behemoth stretches beyond the full comprehension of even the most sophisticated market participants. <coughs> now, what I'm suggesting to you is that, in fact, the language of the law, the language of case law in relation to this area, has also reached the point where it's converging on the... Uh, incomprehensible. So that people run away from this topic and they say, oh, state aid, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, you know don't, don't ask me about that. What, I don't know what it is. Section 110, oh, Jesus, I'm going to never be able to figure that one out. I'll just give you an example from section 110. I'm, I'm assuming most people here know what we're talking about in general terms. Uh, here's a, a quotation from section that says, uh, this is Section 5, notwithstanding paragraph B, subsection 4 shall apply to any interest or other distribution paid by a qualifying company in respect of a specified instrument, other than so much of such interest or other distribution as is paid to a specified person. God, I lost my in respect of a specified instrument where, at the time the instrument was issued, the qualifying company was in possession or aware of information, including information about any arrangement or understanding in relation to ownership of the instrument after that time which could reasonably be taken to indicate that interest or other distributions which would be payable in respect of that instrument would not be subject, without any reduction computed, by reference to the amount of such interest or other distribution, to a tax in a relevant territory which generally applies to profits, incomes or gains received in that territory by persons from sources outside that territory. Right. That's the law. That's, yeah, that's section, part of section 110. <coughs> So, the difficulty with this is, you may have suspected that this section may not have been drafted by the Parliamentary Draftsman's Office. One of the key difficulties we have is that this, the, this section has been drafted by the tax advisors to the beneficiaries. That, that's a key albatross hanging around the neck of section 110, and it is something that cries out for the intervention of the European Commission. We have a situation where the Irish law uh, is, is complex 
And uh, just give you another another example from that. I'll give you another example. Uh, the definition of generally accepted accounting practice. What is a generally accepted accounting practice? You think, well, it's, I'm sure it's, I'm sure they worked that out properly. You know, it's, it's obviously some code somewhere. It means Irish generally accepted accounting practice as <laughs> it's applied for a period of account ending on the 31st of December 2004. What? <laughs> so. This is handing the calculation of tax liability and quantum of tax liability to the taxpayer. He says, you tell us what your generally used accounting practice was at the time, and that's it then, you know, we're with, with no argument. Okay, story over. That's another example of this, the section itself, 110. Section 110 runs to, this is small type print, one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and a half pages. So that's, that, those are the amendments. All right, that's section, 100, section uh, 110. As against that, we have uh, amazing, it's a very short document. Article 107, just one page. Somebody was falling down on the job there. Obviously, there should have been a whole chapter on it. <laughs> Just one page. <clears throat> and it, it is the start of an analysis which shows that, uh, that in examining where we're at here, the, the, the law material, the legal materials which the Commission relies on are, if you like, they're, they're models of clarity compared to the Irish materials. And that goes further, that goes further into the, into the uh, in, intersection between, or the conflict between the Irish government and the Irish government authorities and the Euro European authorities, because the Irish government seems to be, uh, if you like, on the back foot in relation to the European Commission, because the European Commission, if you like, seeks to obtain clarity as to what's happening and seeks to uh, uh, invoke <laughs> simple principles uh, to uh, determine the, the very essence of the single market. Yet very essence of the competitive marketplace. I'll give you an example. This is from the Apple report. This is the report on Apple. The Commission decision. Oh, don't give me your reference. That's anyway. It's quite long. Page three hundred and two, or paragraph three hundred and two. <clears throat> this is an extraordinary detailed document, which I'm sure none of you have read. What's amazing about the detail is the extent to which the uh, uh, Commission. This is the Commission decision. The, the Commission, the DG. Uh, explored not just this, the, um, the, the um, ruling that was made in respect of Apple and their profit transfers, but also the actual uh, um, minutes of meetings, the actual um, pre preparatory materials available in Dublin and so on and so forth. <coughs> and so 302, moreover, when Apple <coughs> presented <coughs> the illustrative account filing filling, sorry, the, the illustrative account filling format of AOEs, that's Apple's Irish branch to Irish revenue, for the purposes of obtaining the 1991 ruling, it allocated the costs associated with CAA, CSA to that branch and not to its head office. <coughs> While Irish revenue does not appear to have examined the terms of the CSA <coughs> when it issued the contested tax rulings, the fact that the costs of the CSA were allocated to AOA's Irish branch by Apple itself should have made Irish revenue question the unsubstantiated assumption underlying the profit allocation methods ultimately endorsed by it that the Apple IP licenses should be allocated outside of Ireland. Well, that's about as, as, as uh, intrusive a, a, a finding of fact on, on, by, by the Commission, which you're never going to get by asking a dull question. So, I'll give you an example of what's going to happen when you ask a dull question. Here is... A report from the Sunday Times, it's November 20th, 2018. And uh, Mick Wallace, 
asserted that uh, there was some kind of <coughs> dodgy dealing in relation to a NAMA transaction. And uh, <coughs> asked in the Dáil about PAC member Catherine Murphy whether he was satisfied that Na the NAMA Act provided for full disclosure. Pascal Dunn, who the finance minister, said NAMA had a, quote, a policy of obtaining written confirmation <laughs> that, <the laughs> that purchasers of NAMA secured assets are not precluded by section 107. Or 172. Quote, any person who intentionally, recklessly, or through gross negligence provides false or inaccurate information to NAMA commits a crime, said Donoghue. In addition, under section 6 of the Statutory Declaration Act 1938, it is a criminal offence for a declarant to make a declaration which is false or misleading. And does he seriously think that the Irish authorities are actually going to pursue a, a, a declarant to see whether or not the, the, the Statutory Declarations Act has been breached? Is, is the, are the Irish, are the, is the, are the guards going to go into NAMA to see, <laughs> to see what statutory declarations were made and whether or not they should prosecute? Who is going to complain? Who is going to initiate the, uh, the process by which the law is to be enforced in a situation like this? This, incidentally, was in relation to a 92% haircut on equipment loans. <coughs> There. Now you might think that the problem is, is solely to do with Ireland, but it is not. It, it deals with, it, it is to deal with England as well. Deal with law generally, because law has a uh, has a um, uh, how do you say, a habit of blurring blurring problems, and sometimes it blurs problems in order to produce if you like, a, a coherent policy or a coherent principle underlining the, the matters. For example, I'm just giving you here. Something that's quite interesting. This is about the subject matter of, of a trust. It says, after Lehman's collapsed in England, they had a lot of litigation. Uh, this is from a, a book by Hudson. He says, Lehman, global banks like Lehman's are in constant motion. When New York went home, Tokyo subsidiaries and personnel took over. Tokyo went to bed, the London rate subsidiaries and personnel took over. And when London leaked home on the underground, New York took over again. He's saying basically you've got, a, if you like, a blending system to deal with global financial markets. And uh, the problem with the collapse of Lehman was that when, the, when, it, when it collapsed, the train stopped and they said, well, who owns this? Mm. And old traditional English law said, you actually have to have a segregated book showing this man owns that bit, you own that bit, he, he owns that bit, and so on and so forth. It's a segregated, so that you can say, right, give me that because it's, it's my investment, give it back to me. Mm. But the English courts, they went, they tiptoed tip around and flipped as to how they should uh, deal with this. Um, it, it really is quite an extraordinary analysis. He says, um, uh, uh, the question was whether the region, this regional hub arrangement, that's to say it was all internalized in Lehman's, meant that there was no trust under the rule book in favor of various subsidiaries and customers, or whether some other analysis could be used. The Court of Appeal without giving a full explanation as to why, and without considering the case law, <laughs> sorry, as a lawyer you have to laugh at this, you know, without considering the case law, <laughs> instead it appeared to be convenient to hold that the parties would have uh, the property rights they wanted, <laughs> even though there had been a conscious failure for over about 20 years within Lehman Brothers to segregate any of the property purportedly held on trust. It goes on down to say, Lloyd, Sip Lloyd L.J. simply concluded without presenting a reasoned argument of his own, beyond summarizing the arguments of others on two bases. First, quote, there is no ground for saying that the trust could not take effect in law because its subject matter lacked certainty. However, as the author says, this does not explain whether the requirement of certainty of subject matter is being rejected in general or whether there is found to be sufficient certainty on these facts. Moreover, this trust takes effect in equity, not in law. Second, his lordship held that, quote, it seems to be clear that an approach involving the use of a trust binding on Lehman's in favour of the affiliate was adopted. <coughs> Although that, all that this assertion does is to assert that there should have been a trust, but not whether there was one. The Court of Appeal followed such and such a case. This judgment does little to analyse the clear rejection of such and such a case in such and such a case, and the weight of journal commentary which similarly rejects it. There is nothing in the judgment to indicate why this case is to be referred to that case, nor indeed why any one case is to be referred to any other. <laughs> this is 
that's why we waste money on lawyers. <laughs> so that case went through three stages in London. There was a follow-up case about Leeds as well. The reason I'm mentioning it is not simply to illustrate the fact that the law can be a bit of an ass at times, but that uh, it, it also explains... Uh, it, it certainly it, it impacts on this question about what a charity is in the context of what we're dealing with here. There's been a lot of public comment about you know the use of charities uh, as the as the shareholder for the for the SPVs, and uh, the reason that is uh, it's not as not as uh, it's not as um, uh, heinous as you might think. It's uh, it, it's a device, nevertheless. It is a device to ensure that in in the in the event unlikely event you understand of a collapse of the investment fund that the uh, investment fund will not, invest, the shares will, which are vested in charity will not fall into the insolvency. Okay, what the hell, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a device, it's a fallback position, a, a, a safety net for the shares in the event of an insolvency. And so the use of an, an Irish charity to hold the shares in an SPV is not actually the source of our difficulty here. It's not, we're, although we take, take offence at the fact that the use, the word charity is used and we say this is really a slap in the face of people who are affected by what's, what's going on. Nevertheless, that's not the issue that the, that the uh, European Commission will be looking at in terms of state aid. <coughs> I'm still on language. Sorry about this now. Uh, here's the, you know, the... The language is used... Sorry, here's a... Here's a, here's a um, um, Irish financing SPVs using you know, section 110 and 110. And what strikes me here is the, is the reference to profit neutrality. This is an investment broker uh, trying to sell SPVs. He says, profit neutrality can then be achieved using profit participation loan notes or total return swaps. It means, basically, we don't pay any tax. A profit participating loan is where the funding for the uh, business, which is the buying and selling of distressed mortgages, this property, mm -hmm. will be... Uh, at a cost, we, we can't, uh, we haven't got the money ourselves, we're, an SP, we're just an SPV, we're just a small office, but we can borrow the money and we get very, very bad terms for it. We get the terms which say, basically, if you make a profit, you can give us all that as, as, your, as your interest, as the interest to which we are entitled on the loan which we advance to you. So at the end, the SPV ends up saying, it's a very, very bad um, business we're in, shocking, it's almost you know, below the break-even point. So the question must be asked, why would you be bothered? Why would you be bothered setting up a business which is almost break even? On this basis, you know, you're you're a mug. You should do something else. Open a petrol station or <laughs> a licensed uh, McDonald's. You do better. Mm -hmm. But of course, the answer is that because it's because you and your funder are one of the same. You're just using <coughs> a, a formula. Uh, and if you like, it's all done by mirrors. You're using a formula to avoid the tax arising in Ireland. You're saying all the money can be shipped, so we have effectively the receivables in the in the business are being transferred abroad. With the result that Ireland is losing out. There's a massive capital outflow. Right now. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so what we have is uh, a difficulty in relation to discussing this at all, because I know here, here we are in the European Parliament, I'm happy to be here, thank you very much, uh, there is an enormous amount of work done, but it, it's quite clear that the, vo the volume of material that's available in this sort of area, which is, which is a niche area, it has, has a chilling effect on, on, on debate. So uh, if we have... Um, we have to look at some sort of uh, um, early indicators of distress and say wh wh whether we should be concerned. So I found a, I found actually a quotation from a book which was written in uh, 2008. So that's before the crash. It's the law and practice of international finance, Sweden actually, on page 459. Uh, Ideally, he says, the SPV is located in a favourable jurisdiction which has low or no taxes. He says. Favoured jurisdictions include no tax jurisdictions such as Cayman, Gibraltar, the British Virgin Islands, Bermuda, and oh, can't even use Jersey, and low tax jurisdictions such as Ireland, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. 
Well, now, any European um, MEP should sit up and say, well, that's a bit concerning now, isn't it? Because, you know, there, there are clearly, um, clearly uh, money is moving for, for tax purposes. Uh, and uh, Ireland just has been targeted on that. So <coughs> we have a long history, actually, of, um, of being, um, if you like, cute with the tax system. And in this regard, I have to draw attention to the fact that the Apple case is about trans price transfer, transfer pricing. And it's not really a state aid case, but there's, there is an overlap. You, ca you can't avoid the, the uh, Commission saying, which of our DGs is going to look at this? Is it the Competition Authority or is it the Trade Authority? Uh, let's say not the Competition Authority, but the DG. So there's an element of, of, of overlapping involved. So that uh, even at the, in the late 1990s, which is all the, when all this kicked off, we had uh, um, uh, documents produced which gave, <coughs> gave us gave sort of guidelines on this. And the first one I, the first one I had was, um, you're probably familiar with them anyway, uh, <coughs> yeah, the Code of Conduct uh, <coughs> on Harm from Tax Competition, that's 1997. You have to bear in mind we're talking about the 1997 Finance Act, which introduced Section 110. The Code of harm, harm, Harmful Tax and Competition says, that, and it's, it's quite alarming because you look at it and it, it leaps out at you. It says, the tax measures covered by this code include both laws, our regulations, and administrative practices. And straight away you say, oh God, I'm not supposed to be just looking at section 110. I'm supposed to be looking at how it's actually being implemented. It's, in the Apple case, it was about the ruling, which wasn't in legislation. It was about simply, an, and it was about how they reached the point where they, they decided on a ruling. Some of the evidence in the Apple case is really quite farcical. You know, on such and such a date, Apple came in and they said, what about 400? And we said, it looked like a good figure. Where did it come from? They said, oh, we just plucked it out of the air. <laughs> and this is recorded by the commission as, as part of their evidence as to the irrationality, if you like, or the, the um, um, complete non-real, non unreal uh, figures that were being thrown around to see whether or not they could to do, you know, uh, cover, patch, patch up the problem. So, uh, whether as, when assessing such measures and harmful accounts should be taken of, whether advantages are accorded only to non-residents or in respect of transactions carried out with non-residents. So, accounts should be taken. So, straight away, they're, they're talking about non-residents. Two, whether advantages are ring-fenced from the domestic market. See, we tick the boxes on all these. Whether advantages are granted even without any real economic activity and substantial economic presence within the member state. Ah, geez, you know. Whether legal provisions are relaxed at administrative level in a non-transparent way. <laughs> uh, this is the code of conduct that was followed by the 1998 uh, the 1998 um, notice on state fiscal aid sets the following four tests to identify: one, favourable tax treatment, which uh, the national measure confers on addressees an advantage which relieves them of charges that are normally borne. Okay, two at the cost of state resources. What's the second one, this is the third. That it affects competition and trade between member states. He says this condition is easily met. And four, selectivity. And then it goes down to this particular author says, for instance, he says, in relation to general availability of relatively short appreciation periods, Ireland pops out at you. Low tax rates Ireland, for instance, ridded, its, ridded itself of special and regional schemes and instead lowered its normal corporate tax rate to 12.5% for all profit-pursuing activities anywhere. And uh, we have uh, also the, the history of the uh, IFSC tax break, which, is, which was approved by the Commission actually back in 1981, or maybe 1981, I can't remember, and has now been withdrawn. So that, that, that's the Commission have changed their minds on it. So there's an evolving process here, a developing process since the late 1990s. And um, the question that I'm most concerned about today is to try and identify what is the, how doing tonight, what is the um, use of state resources, which is, which is uh, uh, part and parcel of this whole business. And it's actually quite difficult to work out. And what I, what I, I think is, 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 first of all, you have to identify the marketplace. Say, what, what, is the, what is the marketplace here? What's being traded? for the purposes of the tax. And what's being traded is liquidity. The banks are trading their liquidity. They say, you know, we'd, li we'd, like, some, we'd like some cash here, you know, because we've, our balance sheet doesn't look great. We'd like some cash here, and we've got a few old dodgy, old dodgy old assets that we might let you have at a discount. But that's essentially the nature of the market, the, the principal market in which we're operating. 
So the question is, if the government introduces a, a tax which says anybody, anybody buying the dodgy assets on a securitized basis, in other words, where there's a where there's a blending, as I call it, of all the assets together, and uh, and then it's they're being sold out to investors, and whether it's participating or not is neither here nor there. The point is, it, that's the nature of the business. Is it, as I say, it's almost a break-even business. They're trading in this. Uh, they, they they buy the um, they buy the the dodgy assets. They give the cash over. The question is, if that's non-tax, if there's no tax on that, or virtually no tax, uh, what would be the tax? What would be the tax if there were no tax break? And the answer is, it'd be the same because <laughs> because. It's a profit participating loan, so your, their cost base is huge. The government hasn't introduced a, some imposition on that, saying your cost base will have to be reduced. They just simply, it's just going to be a break even, standard break even trade where they just about break even and they get to pay a small amount of tax. So the question is how is that then, how is the tax break itself causing, at, at the cost to, to state resources? This is where the economists come in. And the question is, what, hap what would happen if the tax break weren't there? So then you have to say, first of all, is it relevant to find out what, what would happen? Is that something that needs to be analysed? And of course it is, because any selective tax, and this is a selective tax because it's only limited to 10 million upwards, any selective tax has to be, uh, can, may, may pass the test if it's, if it's in, the, in line with the general tax principles or the policy tax or pa tax scheme. So that, um, that the, the the question of what 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 happens outside of the outside of the business is is uh, factored in by the commission when they consider the, the, whether or not there has been a loss of revenue to the to the to the state. What would happen? I, I think there are a number of stages you have to go through. First of all, I think what you would have ha what you would have is you would have the vulture funds going away because they'd say. Uh, we, now, we will now have to pay a realistic price for these properties. <coughs> you, you would, they would say uh, other companies would come in prepared to buy uh, assets of this sort, uh, poor, poor assets of this sort, and, and those companies would, would pay less to the banks. They would, they would be less, less uh, useful for the banks from a liquidity purpose Country, because there's no subsidy there involved in the, in the, the tax break is essentially is a subsidy. <coughs> the other companies, if we call them the, the, the non-SPV companies, would come in <coughs> and, and uh, buy the assets. And then when they traded the assets in the normal way, there would be a profit and there would be tax. So uh, the tax lost is the tax that would be re recoverable if the vulture funds weren't here. So there are a number of steps in it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether or not that hangs together from the economic point of view. But I can tell you this much: if you look at the Apple decision, if you look at all the, the materials that are here about state aid and so on and so forth, this is something that the Commission really should be getting their teeth into. <coughs> now, I, I was asked, what what, uh, what is the what aspects of the marketplace are. Uh, are ripe for analysis in this regard, and there are a number of different legislative uh, matters which I think form form part of the package for, for the tax break, <coughs> which I, th I have to mention. I think there are about ten of them actually. The first thing is Section 110 was amended. Say, oh, yeah, so well, Section 110 was amended in 2007 in the 2017 Act. So then the question arises. Oh, well, if it was amended, what was wrong with it? Was, should tax have been paid prior to then? Is there a state aid up to that point which was then eliminated? So that's, that's, a, that's a warning light straight away. The changing, change in the statute at that point suggests strongly, prima facie, that something was wrong up to that point. And actually what happened in 2016, 2017 Act was that the, um, the, the, Mr. Noonan managed to uh, split the split out the property section of the SPVs. SPVs, by the way, in, them, in themselves are not particularly um, uh, offensive to to business. They're 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 standard and acceptable way of, of funding in, in, in a non-bank sense. 
the securitization model has been with us for a long time, and when the 1997 Act came in, securitization was, was, was designed, uh, was, was in, in, in being, and the IFSC said, we need to have some kind of a, uh, a ready, a ready um, a smoothing of the, of the process by which we have to pay tax on, on simply on our managing of the, of the, of the, of the uh, internet transactions that are going on the 24-hour clock. But it's what happened in, in uh, it's what happened in the crisis when uh, a rogue SPV emerged, if you like. It was like a genetically modified SPV, <laughs> which was one that wasn't dealing in just stocks and money. It was dealing in property, real property, bricks and mortar. And uh, that, that rogue was never intended, that rogue model was never intended to be the beneficiary of the SPV um, tax break. And uh, the, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's rogue, it, it has a, a problem with it because of the fact that the asset is located in Ireland and there, there, are, it, it, there are impacts on the Irish property market and on the housing market which have to be taken into account in terms of the loss of, of revenue, the use of state resources. And I, I have a feeling that even if the Commission were to simply look at up to that point and say <coughs> we're now, we've now been, been given the, 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 the clear signal that there was something wrong, they will say that that's, this is worth this is worth investigating. Next, then you go on to say, well, what was the change in 2016, 2017? <clears throat> and the answer is, we're not quite sure what it was, but the principal difficulty with it is that it was drafted by the tax advisors. That itself is gives rise to the a prima facie case for investigation under state aid. They say, what, what's the you know, look at the Apple decision? Look at the the the, the, the comments made by the commission about the Irish Revenue Authorities, uh, and, and, and now say to yourself, what would, be a, what would be the outcome of an investigation into the 2016 changes? Where did, where did they come from? Who drafted them? Do they understand them? How much of a discretionary element has been included? Is it, a, is it a, like a, a formula for taxpayers to write their own uh, tax bill? Or rather, not write it, right, we'll put it down to zero when they fill in the details later. So that's, that's the first statutory uh, problem that needs to be addressed. There is NAMA legislation which has uh, generated um, uh, in, in its operation which has generated an impetus to the, to the sale of lands uh, into the property into the, into, the, um, pri into the private sector which have been, which have been operated in a particular way and I mean, the particular way we're talking about is a way which actually <coughs> this is complicated as well it actually it, 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 it actually triggered a process of land hoarding which has impacted on, on land prices and on the housing market in Ireland. The NAMA legislation is a context against which the section 110 properly regulated SPVs break, break has to be assessed. There's the uh, there's the fact there are no, no state cooperation for co-ops. None at all. Again, these these are, if you like, the env the environment, the market environment in which in which the housing the housing policy is, is is operating. And the question is whether or not that impacts on 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 the um, the overall level of tax. Regard. There's the fact that the the rulings that are made. These are again within within the administration are are uh, never never made public, and uh, we we're um, none the, none the wiser for everything that goes on behind the doors in the Department of Finance. <clears throat> there is, of course, ECB pressure. And that's not something that the Irish government has, has uh, been active in, but it has nevertheless uh, uh, acquiesced in, in um, presenting to the public the notion that banks are uh, faced with a situation where they have to sell to SPVs. And when the ECB is at pains to point out that, that they, they never said that, they said there are other ways. There are other ways of funding your your illiquid banks, you know, and, and you should be looking at that. But no, the banks have been pushed to the point where the Irish government has said we have now created a uh, an avenue for you, an exit strategy. This is the way to go. So that's that is a a, a motivating factor in the in the uh, preservation of the of the section 110. And a couple of other things as well. <laughs> There's the very fact that if you go down through the, the history of Ireland in relation to in relation to uh, the Commission, that we have uh, we have a bad record. Uh, this is the Primo Roda report. I don't know whether you, you, 
you'd be familiar with that. But anyway, uh, Mrs. Primarola, or Rolo, uh, chaired, chaired a committee to identify the uh, tax, uh, um, unfair tax competitions, competition. And this was back in, again, late, late 1999. <coughs> and, uh, she said, um, um, yeah. 21. Okay, this is a footnote. And you just pick out the footnotes. Ireland jumps out of the footnotes all the time. This is, the footnote relates to this sentence. In cases where participation exemptions are combined with an appropriate controlled foreign company legislation, the measures have not been given a positive evaluation. That means they went down. 21. The Irish delegation could not agree that any evaluation criterion under the code should take account of the level of taxation applied in another country. The code is explicit in providing... Then, that's the, the response to this. This is Dean Primarola. The code is explicit <laughs> in providing that the benchmark is the level of tax generally applying in the member state. In other words, that was the end of their objection. And that happens time and again, you find Ireland sticking its head out and getting slapped down. In the recent Belgian case, they laughingly called the excess profit exemption. Excess profit exemption. If we make too much profit, we won't tax it. That's the Belgian case. Um, you know, I uh, you know member states can show up these cases and uh, make their observations in court. Well, anyway, they went to court. Uh, the only com country that showed up was Ireland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ireland submits, in paragraph 60, submits in essence that the contested decision seriously disturbs the balance of competences between the European Union and the member states established by inter alia Article 360 EU and Article 5 and 2. Confirmed by settled state law, the Commission contends, in essence, that although the member states enjoy member states enjoy fiscal autonomy in the field of direct taxation, any fiscal measure a member state adopts must comply with the state aid rules of EU law. You know, if you were in court <laughs> and you made that submission, and the judge said, "And oh, what about you're wasting your time? Why did we show up? I mean, who in Dublin said, let's send a hotshot team of lawyers out there?" I just don't understand it, because that means now, the Commission says, oh, it's Ireland again, you know, let's not, let's not, let's not laugh too much. They're here again. They've got another sort of cockamamie story to, to tell. <clears throat> now, I'm going to finish up here. Oh, I, I forgot to mention REAP legislation. That's another factor as well in the, in, the, in the overall housing market. I did do a little drawing which showed that we have, what we now have is, uh, is two uh, zero profit, zero tax models for housing. Oh, great, isn't it? Two zero profit, zero tax models. Shouldn't be grasping both of them. One is the cost rental model, which is uh, which has been, you know, uh, available in Europe <laughs> for donkey's years it's since the Second World War, and it produces housing, which there or thereabouts is is available at an affordable, a sustainable level. And the other is the model which we do we <coughs> have. It's also zero ta zero tax, uh, uh, a zero profit, zero tax. And it has the price of housing way up there in order to pay the vulture funds. So, sorry, I mean, if you look at those two, those two um, bar bar uh, codes, and sorry, not bar codes, I'm talking about, um, and, and say this is two two different ways of approaching the same problem. Why is it that we pick the vulture fund way? I, I, I think there's going to be an inquiry some, somewhere down the line. Somebody's going to say we have a housing crisis. Where did we go wrong? And this is going to be one of the key features. It's going to be a, a choice made to uh, re-liquidize, uh, re I was going to say, yeah, the banks to, to make them solvent again by means of subsidizing foreign capital to come in through a, through a, 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 a securitized scheme, acquiring the property, uh, and then selling it on. Now, I have uh, the logic of my proposals. Yeah. What I'm here to do is to say uh, there should really be a state aid investigation. That's, I'm calling on the Commission to do that. I think I've laid out uh, a prima facie case for that. But there is an alternative, which is, which is even more interesting in a way, and it's more immediate, and that is that the Irish Revenue Authorities are in a position to issue a tax assessment. Just write a, pick a figure, say you're assessed a tax. I'm sure some of you may already have received, received one of these. <laughs> And then you say, oh, good God, now I have to call my accountant and I, now I've got a problem. There's absolutely no reason why the Irish Revenue Authorities shouldn't issue a tax and say, we think actually that you don't benefit under Section 110. And then let the argument commence. 
It's at that point that we will flush out what exactly those uh, obscure sections mean, whether or not, in fact, there is a uh, any, whether, whether or not there is, has been a proof offered by the taxpayers uh, as required under the section, whether or not there's been reasonable assumptions by the revenue authorities, and so on and so forth. There's a whole mass of problems as a taxpayer if I get an assessment and I say I now have to make sure that I fall within the, the four corners of that, of that tax break. And I think you might find that the, um, the, the result of the tax assessment would be that, in fact, the exemption did not apply to the property-related property SPVs, I think you would find that there would be a tax liability. That being so, the Commission's exercise would then be unnecessary. But <coughs> the fallback position is that the, uh, the, the tax exemption appears, some judge decides that it appears to be watertight. And the fallback position then is, okay, if it's watertight, then does it offend or breach state aid rules? Because that's the, a whole different question. So we have, a, we have a double, a pincer movement here which can arrest this problem, uh, which is the, a combination of the domestic uh, action and action in Brussels. Now you might ask yourself, <coughs> will any politician in, in Dublin actually recommend this? Um, the answer is probably they won't because they don't understand it. They'll say, well, the Minister of Finance said, it's, you know, it's something we've done and it's, it seems to be you know, working all right. And it's, it's in the statute, so it must be right. And it's only when you, you drill down into, this, into the statute and compare it with what happened in the, in the Apple case and in all the other cases about how the Commission goes about its business to assess the impact of, a, of, a, of state aid that you realise that there is a, a, a real prima facie case there to um, uh, condemn the, the state aid that, that has been used in, in the particular context of the property-related SPVs. Because the standard securitized model for funding is one which has, as I say, been around since 1997, and I think it remains uh, a tool which is, uh, which is available uh, throughout the world. I should also say that this is not transfer pricing. It's not a transfer pricing question. So in the sense that it, you say it might be Apple too, <coughs> Apple being a transfer pricing case, uh, the, the parallel is not identical. It's not, it's, there is an element of a question mark over the apportionment of costs, which might be regarded as, as falling within the transfer pricing um, area of, of dispute. And so I, I would say there's a, there's a, a definite possibility that <coughs> the Commission, having uh, struck the blows, if you like, in Apple, are well prepared at this point to take on the state aid uh, um, measures in section 110. And that's what I'm referring, that's what I'm uh, recommending. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks. That was, uh, that was uh, um, excellent. Um, uh, if there's anyone around the table who wants to ask a question, please do. We're going, basically we have about nine minutes uh, for questions and answers and then we're going to go to uh, Constantine's report on uh, CMU. So. Any questions there? Just on, on, on the section, and that's one thing you were saying about the writing of it, and that's, you know, yeah. it wasn't done by the, the usual uh -huh. legal draftsman, but like, are you saying that it was written elsewhere? Yes. By whom? Uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers <laughs> and uh, Arthur Anderson and all these boys. So they're writing out of financial law? Yes, and not only that, but having written it, within 24 hours, they announced to their customers that they had a way around it. <coughs> <laughs> so uh, that that kind of uh, sort of distracted <coughs> people from the idea that they might have written it. Because if you were, if you had written it, you, why would you do that? But they wrote it. Michael Lunan said, "Okay, we'll do that." And then they announced they had enough uh, an alternative, a way around it. And is this known in the Doyle Ed as well, like by the by supposedly the legislators? Yeah. And any objection to that? Well, I mean, it's 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 something that's difficult to prove. The commission could prove it. No, but I'm saying, has there been any objection within the door? No, like, again, it's, it's not, you see, it's not a daily issue here. This yeah. is the problem. It's, there's, there's a chilling effect of all this legislation and stuff. And, the, and, and the, of course, there's a bit of the green jersey as well. The idea that this particular piece of legislation might actually impact. They've managed to get away with it on the basis that uh, people have shouted that people shouldn't be using charities to seize properties. And, and that, can, that can be battered away because that's not the reality. The, the charity formula is... Uh, 
uh, as I say, it's offensive though it might be, is not a tax break. And you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned about uh, Ireland turning up with a team of lawyers to the, the whole... Uh, the Belgian case. Yeah, to the Belgian case. Is, uh, I don't, it's very hard to get inside the minds of the people who make these decisions, but is, is it just a case of they turn up so that they'll... Uh, uh, they well, they feel they look better with companies like Apple, etc. Or uh, no, uh, we no will defend no, the no. Obviously, of Ireland gets notified of all cases that are coming before the courts, and they're invited as member states to to uh, intervene. But what the rationale is for for um, I suspect in that case it was because there was a private company involved which uh, was benefiting from the from the transaction from the uh, profit, profit exemption. Uh, uh, but which also had a subsidiary in Ireland, so that's you know it's suspect. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to thank you, Luke, for bringing Edmund over, and to thank you, Edmund, for your presentation. Um, just in terms of your task of getting the Commission to initiate mm -hmm. stated um, pr proceedings, um, it won't be easy, as I'm sure you mm -hmm. gather. The Commission isn't always benign in these respects. One of the reasons why well, they, they were so down quite a lot the the were, and one of the reasons why they were so vigorous in relation to Apple case yeah. um, was because other member state governments felt that they had lost out in terms of tax yeah. tax re tax revenue. They have a different approach to the to vulture funds and the role of vultures. Um, a lot of people in Ireland don't realise that the prevalence of vultures is really only um, happening in Ireland and Spain. Mm -hmm. It's not actually an EU-wide phenomenon and the Commission is actually setting out yeah. to try and encourage other states to adopt the uh, um, Irish model as a mechanism by which it can deal with so the non-performing um, loans mm -hmm. um, issue. So, I su so the emphasis of the Commission and the Commission by and large deal with these things collectively across the Commission so while Vestager may have a uh, particular uh -huh. input in terms of um, in pursuing a case, um, it may not be shared across the, the board. So the case that's presented to the Commission needs to be very strong when yeah. you want to open the, um, to get them to pursue a case on, mm. on state aid yeah. that might not necessarily be their instinctive yes. um, position. So you'll have a lot it's of against work. the grain. The mm. question, I suppose, in terms of the case, was, so we had raised questions in relation to what would appear to most people to be state aid in the form of tax breaks mm -hmm. being provided to the banks, the mechanism in which they're able to mm -hmm. write off their losses mm -hmm. in the years in which they were bailed out for up to 20 years, which essentially means that they won't be paying, mm -hmm. paying taxes. Um, that to us is basically another grant, another bailout, mm -hmm. um, but the Commission have refused to countenance as state aid on the basis that every bank can avail of mm -hmm. the That's same right. mechanism. Yeah. The, the question that to, um, appears to be the most obvious one that the Commission will present, well, this is available to every vulture fund, mm -hmm. therefore it's <coughs> not in, in de facto state aid, because while it might not be available to any other type of company in terms of being able to use the section yeah, 110 no, and there, the chart. There, there are other companies who could, who could buy the, the bank's bad assets. Yeah. Which are not, which are not, um, who don't have that They don't have advantage. 10 million to start off with. Yeah. So that's that's straight away you've got selectivity there. If you say you can buy into this, if you've got your 10 million on day one, that's what it says. Mm. I mean, uh, nobody in the in the non-profit area can can afford to do that, and you're not allowed into the data room, so you can forget it, you know. So it is a selective aid, and and that ipso facto means there's a, 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 a disturbance of a marketplace. Yeah, just to say in relation to... No, so the, sorry, for, for, sorry. There are foreign, i.e. European uh, finance bodies, cooperatives, housing cooperatives and so forth, which could have been attracted into Ireland uh, in the, in the appropriate, if an appropriate market existed. Yeah, just in terms of the role of the, the big four in terms of the accounts, there's nothing unusual at all no. about them <coughs> setting out tax policy and then um, advising their commission. We commissioned a report last year just on the role that they have done that was adopted by um, the Tax Avoidance Committee, yeah. Special Committee that had been um, set up here. It's not only something that happens at an Irish level, yeah. that happens right across the yeah. world, and it happens at a European Commission yeah. level, where the big four, Price Waterhouse, um, um, Ernest, and, Ernest and Young, um, Deloitte, um, and um, KPMG. KPMG, of course, they all 
advise governments in terms yeah, of and their politicians tax policy are afraid of being spoken of as idiots who kind of don't yeah. understand this stuff, you know, so so they really should keep quiet. Well the big four have the, yeah. the markets behind yeah. them. So these yeah. infamous markets yeah. are going to intervene to yeah. quash well, markets always have other places to invest. Yeah. There's an article in Fordham International Law Journal, it's Transfer Pricing Rules and State Aid by Richard Lyle, L-Y-A-L, member of the European Commission, please, on the staff. Invited, in 2015, yeah. volume 38, issue 4. A very good article, which shows up-to-date thinking about it. He's also critical of the court, of course, but anyway, that's, that's just between the Commission and the court. But again, it's a very clear, a very clear article, if anyone's interested. Does anyone else uh, have a question? We have about two minutes left uh, with Ed before we go to Constantine's report. I'll, I'll be happy to pipe in with a uh, question because uh, to me it appears that um, I Ireland's role has been like a, effectively a Trojan horse throughout the years for the all sorts of the innovation and creativity surrounding the taxation regime and all for the rest of Europe. Can you see this SPV structure, section 110, being used to offshore out of Ireland into the rest of the EU? And if so, is that, a, you know, in your view, a legitimate point of pressure on the Commission to start an investigation? Uh, I think it already is, actually. It's, it's certainly offshoring in the sense that we also have Irish SPVs. Uh, we have American SPV, obviously, but Cayman Islands and so on and so forth. But we, we obviously have Irish SPVs. It's a, it's a, a vehicle that's, a, that's available. But uh, the, the securitization is, is simply a, a, a recognition of, of where we are in, in world finance. It's, it's impossible now, the, as you see, the English courts found it impossible to say we have to, to, un, un, to cut the Gordian knot and, and make sure we don't. So the, the, we just have to go with the flow. That's basically what the English court said. And I could, I could see the Commission um, uh, um, certainly uh, being concerned if capital was being directed from Europe into Ireland. There is a case on it. There's Netherlands. Netherlands was involved in a case. Uh, I sent you the reference uh, mm -hmm. where they said uh, that they had a particular tax arrangement because they wanted to attract back capital that was ex being exported out of the country, mm -hmm. and I think that was held also to be uh, selective and uh, state aid. I can't remember when that was. No, relatively recently. I sent you the reference. Yeah, yeah. But I couldn't track it down. <coughs> okay. When we talk about the SPVs. Um, we have the, Ireland has the robust of the SPVs, of course, called NAMA SPV, yes. the sole owner of the entire entity of NAMA, mm -hmm. and NAMA, uh, ML, and all the rest of them. And there's a very interesting issue there as well relating to it, and I don't know if it's getting traction here right now in Europe or not, uh, but it should, and this is a relationship between whether NAMA can be treated as the uh, sovereign agency under the uh, FSIA in the United States, um, you know, Foreign Sovereign Investment uh, yeah. Exemption Act, um, or uh, should it be treated as the private entity, as the Irish government has adamantly uh, insisted it is, and the Eurostat has issued a ruling as well. And that's a very interesting issue as well. Uh, I read in a, in a book published some years ago uh, a rather disheartening comment about how the law impacts on, on banking, how the law affects banking at a, at a time of crisis. It says up to the point where there's a crisis, the law operates. But as soon as there's a crisis, the banks do what the politicians and the regulators tell them to do, and that's what the law is at that point. So in other words, there's, there's a switch. The switch is switched, and then they, they have to do what the regulators tell them to do. And so that's their cover. Well, we, um, uh, as you know, Ed, we've been in with uh, DJ Competition, and we're going with uh, Max uh, Lienemeyer, uh, talking to him about this, and I suppose uh, the obvious next step is to get yourself in there, if you're, you're willing, and sit down and uh, talk to him about uh, basically what you've said here today, right, yeah. and see can we push it uh, yeah. further forward, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, okay, it'd be nice if it was done in Ireland, uh, but uh, um, uh, what's, the chance, yeah. what's the chance of that, and I know there are people like Pierre Starty and people like Mick Wallace, uh, uh, they'd uh, absolutely no problem going hook, line and sinker after all of this thing, but sure, if there isn't the will at home, no matter how talented people like Pierce are, um, uh, they're not going to they're not going to burst through that. So basically, the way I see it is, it's going to have to happen out here, or it's not going to happen at all. To well, the, the revenue do have their own. Mm -hmm.